we're desperately screwed, but not totally screwed. <laughs> <laughs> is that a we, fair? I think it's fair, and actually, there are, we've been there before in different contexts. Um, uh, it ain't ever easy, you know. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I, I, I come out of this. It's a two-year process, really. That I've been through uh, doing all the interviewing and the research and so on, and, and mulling it over and trying to digest rather large amounts of material. And I have come out of the process more optimistic than I began it. Really? Oh, yeah. You see, um, I didn't fully understand the way things join together, and so it just looks like an enormous wave that's going to bury you, you know. Once you get past denial and disbelief and all that sort of thing, um, and you just read the bare predictions of what might go wrong or what is likely to go wrong or when do we get to this particular phase of the disaster, uh, it, you do feel helpless. You feel um, completely disempowered. And um, you know, I've got kids, I've even got grandchildren. And um, so that was not a pleasant feeling. Um, but uh, if a little do knowledge is a dangerous and deeply depressing thing, more knowledge is not necessarily more depressing. On the contrary, um, when you talk to the scientists, they're very clear, and you know, I mean the scientists who study climate change, not the deniers who are mostly in other fields. Um, the um, the general tenor is, you know, I mean, there is an undercurrent of, of panic in a lot of the conversations because they, over the last couple of years, they have begun to believe that the uh, real world is outrunning their models, um, that things are moving faster than the high end of their predictions, um, which is uncomfortable, to say the least. Um, so there's that level of, of real concern, fright, I would say. Uh, but at the same time, because they understand how everything joins up, um, they kind of know where you could intervene and tinker a bit and, you know, slow things down or um, move it off this track entirely. And most of them, though, the, the technology end of it is not really their business, have already gone and looked at what alternative technologies might be available because they care how this comes out. And, and can point you in the right directions. Um, and the technologies are available. I mean, one of the conclusions that, that struck me was that we're still really very lucky because we embarked upon the process of building our civilization, the mass civilization, the industrial civilization we live in, uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and we built it on burning fossil fuels. And if we struck this kind of crisis in terms of emissions, say, 50 years ago, you know, suppose it wasn't Japan and Asia that industrialized, but China. And that all happened in the late 19th century. So you got a lot more emissions and you arrive at the crisis point in 1950, we'd be totally screwed. Because there were no alternative technologies available. You were, you, fossil fuels are nothing. And um, as it happens, you know, 50, 60 years later, lots of alternative technologies available. Um, you've got nuclear for generating power. You've got solar, both in the, you know, sort of solar electric, the, um, you know, so the cells, solar cells, and also solar thermal, where you just use mirrors and focus it on a boiler and get steam as your, as your mode of power for driving a turbine. You've got um, wind power, you've got wave and tidal power, a bit marginal, but it, you know, it could fill 2 or 3% of demand. And you've got geothermal coming along, which is really promising hot rock. You know, drill down a couple of kilometers and two holes, a kilometer apart, hot wa you know, cold water down one hole at high pressure, filter through some cracked rock, crack it yourself with the high pressure if necessary, and you get high pressure steam coming up the other hole, clap a turbine on the top of the second hole, you got power. Uh, all of these are now available. Uh, replacing liquid fuels for vehicles, transportation, is a trickier business. The current generation of biofuels certainly doesn't do the job and was never designed to cope with greenhouse gas emissions anyway. It was a sort of energy independence gesture. You know, we we're going to replace foreign oil. 
It wasn't about replacing oil. Um, and it doesn't actually uh, deal with greenhouse gas emissions, but there are biofuels that could and would provide perfectly adequate fuel, fuel for vehicles. I mean, you, you sort of grow algae in vats rather than use good agricultural land and water to uh, you know, grow corn and turn it into fuel. Then you've got a high energy fuel which will run your vehicle fleet. You, we're not going to stop driving cars. I mean, the idea that we're all going to wear, live wear, you know, simply and wear hair shirts and put on more and more you know, woolies in the wintertime, that, that's not how we get through this. We change the way we generate the energy. Uh, you know. But it's there. The techniques are there. If you had to put some money on it. Well, I think we'll make it through. I mean, you see, if, it, if we were sitting in this room 40 years ago, you would have asked exactly the same question, except you'd have been talking about nuclear war. Good point. And we got through that one. I, and that was the midterm. This is the final exam. But I think we probably will pass. The book we'll is lose a lot of people Yeah. on the way. Can't help that? No. The book is Climate Wars. I've been speaking with the author Gwyn Dyer and Climate Wars, published by Random House of Canada.